So anyways, I was talking about we, if you use the, uh, the real inexpensive balloons, they displace a little bit less air. And so they'll float at a little lower altitude. So they float at 32,000 feet. That's right at the top of the weather. Again, as the, if the balloon was to dip into a cloud, it can pick up frost and that frost will bring it down. So if you use a, a commercially made balloon like an SBS 13, it's a little bit larger, not, not terribly a lot larger, but a little bit larger. And it floats a little higher altitude. They usually run about 42,000 feet. And that gets us the boat all but the most extreme weather. So that's a, a really good reason. The, the issues is the Chinese balloons cost 50 cents a piece and the SBS balloons cost about 150 bucks a piece. So there's a huge difference in cost there. Um, as far as the lifting gas, um, me and my friend, we use hydrogen, uh, H2, and that's because it provides more lift than helium. But um, the main reason is why there's less leakage. Helium leaks out of everything. You can't keep it into anything. And uh, you may wonder why. Well, isn't hydrogen a smaller atom? Well, yes, that's true. But hydrogen is diatomic. So there's two atoms stuck together. And those two atoms stuck together are actually larger than a single helium atom. So hydrogen doesn't leak quite as fast. In fact, it does uh, pretty darn good compared to helium. The other issue with helium is laws in many states and many countries now to protect idiots uh, require that helium you buy in a lot of locations has to have a certain amount of air or oxygen in it. And that's because people will breathe it until they die. <laughs> So these laws to protect these idiots uh, affect us. Now you can go to a gas supply house and get, you know, pure helium. And uh, now one other thing in the last couple of years is helium has become very expensive, way more expensive than hydrogen. So that, that in itself is another reason that uh, we go to hydrogen. And then uh, speaking of the balloon, to talk a little bit more about it. Um, the amount of gas you put in the balloon is how do you determine that? Well, we determine it by using what's called free lift. And free lift is the amount of lift that it takes to lift the payload plus that little bit more. And that little bit more is usually six to eight grams for our size balloons. And what that does is that really doesn't change your float altitude. That change how fast you ascend from the ground up to your float altitude. And where that comes into to play is you need to get up through layers of the atmosphere that have, might have moisture in it so that you don't build up moisture on the balloon and it frees up and then bring the balloon back down before you make altitude. So if you ascend too slow, you'll get, you'll build up ice, or if you're lucky, you'll get to altitude and you'll have less pressure inside the balloon. And that's, that's a good thing, but chances are you'll build up ice on the way up and it won't make it all the way up. If you put too much gas in it at the surface, when it gets to altitude, the pressure inside will be too great and it'll stress the envelope and possibly break it. So here we are, um, I got a tank of uh, hydrogen there on the right and I'm transfilling it into, or into a smaller container because it's easier to handle when we're out in the field running around. Um, this is a picture of N6JED, my friend and I, and we're filling some balloons in his shop and we're using a heat sealer here. It's just a standard bag heat sealer and we're closing off the neck after we feel, fill it. And we're also attaching, I don't know if you can see the small thin Kevlar line that, uh, is holding one of our trackers. So let's talk a little bit about the payloads and the payloads. For, so for we is we're using ham radio, the ham radio transmitters. And generally there's two different kinds of them. Um, you can transmit APRS on two meters and that's usually a half a watt. And if you guys see the little black screen come up, uh, that's, that's I'm running something in the background. I'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, because I'm expecting to hear from my balloon at any minute. So <laughs> um, let's see, let me back up here. So there's two different ways of uh, getting information down from the balloons. You can use APRS uh, on two meters, and that's at a half a milliwatt generally. Or we can use Whisper on 20 or 30 meters, and that's at 10 milliwatts. And um, the, let's, the advantages of um, APRS. Well, let me stop for a second. The reason we use these two systems for the most part is because there's a lot of infrastructure in place already. There's a lot of people on the ground listening for APRS all over the world. Any big city is going to have APRS in it, almost every city in the world. And a lot of small places have APRS. 
So if you fly over there, um, that infrastructure is already there and we just kind of hitchhike on it and it'll pick up the balloon. It'll give us a lot of data. There's a lot of bandwidth on two meters so we can get a lot of data down and that works great. It doesn't work very well when you're over oceans and deserts or Africa, something like that, because remember it's doing using two meters and uh, two meters is line of sight. Even at 40,000 feet where, you know, line of sight might be a whole state, um, it's still limited to that much and it doesn't do any good over the oceans and things or over the deserts and things. Whisper on the other hand is a HF mode. And on 20 meters at 10 milliwatts, it's really common to do two or 3000 miles at 10 milliwatts. The drawback with Whisper though, is the bandwidth is really narrow. We can only transmit 50 bits. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, but so you can only put a very limited amount of data down. And then there's uh, other trackers out there that people are using, um, QRSS, uh, which is really slow Morris, Internet of Things, LoRaN, uh, the reverse beacon network. Uh, some people just do a CW beacon and that's just strictly a beacon and they'll use the RBN network to see if it is. But lately some people have been adding that to their other trackers. And uh, when they're not heard, they might be able to pick it up that way. So these payloads, um, they're all solar powered. Uh, so they only work when there's sunlight shining on them and we don't fly any batteries. And you probably think, well, that's probably because the batteries are heavy. Well, that's, that's true. That's one reason, but that's not the primary reason. Primary reason we'll fly batteries is because batteries will freeze up there in the atmosphere. It's, it's really cold. Um, most of our flights are running about minus 10 degrees centigrade. So the batteries would freeze and to keep these uh, batteries from freezing, you have to use power to keep them from freezing. So you have to put little heaters in there. And it becomes a diminishing return. If you've got a battery, you need a bigger battery because you've got to have heaters to keep it alive and bigger and bigger and bigger until it just, it's impractical for our type of balloons that we're flying. Uh, what we do is we do supercapacitors on the trackers. So that way they're a little uh, 50 milliwatt solar panel can charge up a couple supercapacitors and then you can do a brief APRS burst at half a watt using that energy you stored up over a couple minutes. And uh, the interesting thing, that's one of the reasons that super, capers, super capacitors were originally invented for doing work just like that. So we're using them for that reason. There are some, um, some issues with super caps. They're really sensitive to being over voltaged. So we found we were losing a few of our trackers as they flew and um, they were, were probably over volting the super caps. And now we've been adding uh, some precision voltage regulators to them. Let's see, the other thing about a payload is they need to be frequency agile. And what the heck does that mean? Well, we're used to using APRS here in the US, right? So APRS in the US is all on one frequency, but a lot of people don't realize when you go to other countries, APRS is running different frequencies. So this payload needs to know where it is in the world, and if you're trying to do APRS, it needs to be changing uh, frequencies. So it's doing the right APRS frequency based on what location it is. And then geofenced. Mm -hmm. And geofence is where you don't transmit over certain parts of the world because that violates the amateur radio rules and regulations in those areas. Um, Great Britain is one area, uh, North Korea, and man, I can, I always forget what the, the third one is, there's three places in the world that primarily uh, you're not allowed to transmit uh, amateur radio from airborne platforms. And it's specifically stated. So we geofence these trackers to try to just, you know, be a, a good amateur radio operator and follow the rules. Here's a picture of a tracker. I don't know if you can see my little, can you see my mouse? Okay. Yes, we can. Yep, we can see the mouse. So this is a tracker that's flying right now. And I'll talk about it in a, in a few minutes, but this is one you'll actually, I'll show you some pictures of it actually being launched and uh, we'll look at where it is at the moment. So um, because this was gonna fly high and uh, a few other things, I put dual solar panels on it and it's got some redundancy built in. And on it, you can see there's a little GPS antenna on the top, a GPS chip, uh, basically a GPS receiver. There's a computer here. There's some voltage regulation and stuff. And on the backside, there's two transmitters. There's a VHF 
uh, transmitter and there's an HF transmitter. And then there's a pair of supercapacitors on the back. And all of this plus all of the rigging and everything to hold it and a full 20 meter dive hole all weighs 17 grams. Again, that's less than two US quarters. So wait, wait, wait. Um, these are some different transmitters at the top and their general weights. They were in, you know, nine to 10 grams. Solar panels run in at about one and a half grams each. So, you know, and then um, like the HF antenna, full 32 foot antenna is only like 1.6 grams because we're using this 5 thousandths inch wire for that antenna. We tried using 4 thousandths inch wire, but the 4 thousandths inch wire is so thin, it's impossible to even work with. The 5 thousandths, you can't even see, but you can work with it, you can handle it. When you go any smaller than that, it becomes just absolutely uh, unworkable. It's just too small. Um, on the VHM antenna, we found that we can just use a guitar string this particular one, it's not stainless, so we can solder it. And uh, it's nice and springy, so it will straighten itself out and makes, you know, hangs nice and neat. It doesn't require a weight on the other end. So this is all kind of stuff we learned as we went along. So when you launch one of these balloons, there's some major milestones. People say, oh, I want to launch one of these. I want to fly around the world. Well, that's great, but you really need to be prepared to go through all the growing pains because there's all the preparation, there's, you know, trying to do things correctly, and then there's a lot of luck involved. Um, so some of the major milestones is when you launch one of these, receiving that first airborne transmission, that's a major milestone. A lot of balloonists never make it to there. And then having the balloon make it to your altitude, your uh, 32,000 or your 42,000 foot, whatever you're projected at, making it to that altitude and then leveling off at that altitude. So it doesn't blow past altitude and burst, or it doesn't, you know, fail before it gets there. That's a huge milestone. Most balloons die between two and three right there, between one and two or two and three. That's where most uh, balloons that are launched, that's as far as they ever make it. You get lucky and you've done all the, you know, as best you can preparations, it'll live through the first night and then it'll wake up in the morning. Um, Again, you know, this thing's now been in deep freeze at some, you know, high altitude, frozen solid. The sun comes up in the morning and you're hoping everything is still correct. You don't have any cold solder joints or anything that's not right will show up after it's been frozen all night long. And so then, you know, hearing it report in that next second morning, that's, that's really a huge milestone. When you make it past there, now you start to, you know, need more luck. So from there on, you want to make sure, you know, you're looking at the weather, you're looking at all this other stuff, hoping that you make it through there. Then ultimately, you're going to come to an ocean or um, like North Africa or something like that. And crossing one of those uh, major parts of the world, that is like your next major milestone. And then ultimately to circumnavigate the entire globe. So making it back uh, all the way around. And everyone wants to go to step five. And step five, I'll show you how many launches we've done so far. And it's a very difficult thing to achieve. So here are some flights we've done. Um, I, just, I listed 12 of them. Our first one, and this is really just to explain to people that like, this is not an easy thing to do. So our first one ran three days and it went down in the North Atlantic. Um, the North Atlantic seems to like to suck these balloons up, especially the ones flying at like 32,000 feet. There's always storms up there. They always go up and around the 35 to 37,000 feet. And uh, if you end up over there and you're flying at that altitude, they just tends to eat them up. Uh, the second balloon never made it to altitude. That was because of a failure on the ground on the person that launched its part, uh, me. <laughs> you get launch fever and get excited. And I forgot to take one of the weights off and it went across the ground. It hit a barbed wire fence. And then it got away from us and disappeared out into the desert. So it was a real disaster, but we learned a lot from that. The third one ran 13 days. That uh, We thought we lost it over the North Atlantic again, but it turned out it went south in the Atlantic and it showed up uh, over uh, Africa and then uh, made its way across uh, through uh, Libya and Egypt and Israel and then went down the Iran-Pakistan 
area and ended up in Emirates. And uh, it went down there, probably in a large sandstorm. They had a huge sandstorm that day. The fourth one only lasted one day. I'm going to skip ahead here. Oops. The fifth one ran 110 days. That's the longest so far. It did five and a half circumnavigations of the globe. And it went down in a giant typhoon off of Guam. Uh, then we had a seven-day balloon and a three-day balloon. And... We launched a number of them at Quartz Vest that land, they all ran about two days and they all were going out into the North Atlantic, except for one that had a leak. And we were able to watch it. Number 10 had a leak in it. We watched it come down very slowly. It floated about a thousand feet off the ground over Iowa and Kansas. And the only reason it probably lasted was because there was no mountains there. And then uh, the 11th balloon which launched on Thursday morning at Quartz Fest, and it made it one and a half laps around the world, and uh, we lost it over Nova Scotia. And the 12th balloon is still in flight, and it's been in flight for 51 days as of right now, and I'll talk about it a little bit more in a minute, but it's uh, done four and a half laps around the world so far. So here's a, a typical Pico balloon launch. You can see the envelope here. It's only partially filled with gas. In fact, it's mainly empty of gas because as it goes up it's going to expand and that'll fill out the rest of the balloon and you can see it here going up this is at my uh, friend's house we launch out in the desert quite often it's not far from edwards air force base and you can see the balloon there and see the tracker now that i pointed it out and there's the 20 meter dipole does everybody see that <laughs> no, it's pretty hard to see. Uh, and like again said, that's a you can kind of get the distance of it, but it's a uh, very, very thin wire. And of course, that's me. So the balloon that's flying right at the moment in 60DO15, it weighs 15 grams. Again, that's that's really light, and that's the entire um, package. So I, I mentioned that the tracker was a computer and voltage regulators all on there. We have GPS, GPS antennas, we have a Whisper HF and APRS transmitters, two solar panels, it has a couple isolation diodes. When we start talking about these light weights, even adding diodes, you've got to calculate the weight of a couple diodes because that adds to your overall um, flight package and what it weighs, and it can make a difference on what you're trying to do. Supercapacitors, we have shunt regulators on each of the supercapacitors, and that helps keep them... Uh, right well within their uh, their specifications so we don't blow them up. And again, as I mentioned, we have a full 20 meter dipole, uh, VHF antenna, and all the rigging and everything. Again, all of that 15 grams, um, you know, less than, less than half an ounce. Okay, and here's the, uh, here's the tracker itself getting ready to launch. Um, we're, this is a tent, I'll show you some pictures of it in just a second here. And this is a tent we took up and we set up out at Quartz Fest that we were assembling our balloons in in the mornings before we did launches. Um, the tracker setting here, it's on a couple plastic spools and I have the both edges of the dipole wrapped around those spools so that we can deploy it out there and uh, we're ready to launch. So I want to revert for a minute to something else and talk about grid squares. Most of us use grid squares, you know, in our radio so we know what our grid square is. Uh, but our four-digit, our maidenhead grid square is a box, and it box uh, changes depending on where you are, mainly north and south. Well, just north and south. So the size of the box changes. And it's uh, not a square box like a lot of people think, except unless you're right at the equator. Um, it's a trapezoid. So up and where we are in the U.S. and Europe, and that's where most of our balloons fly, it's about 70 miles by 100 miles, the size of the box. The reason I mention that is when we do whisper transmissions, whisper only sends out the maidenhead grid square. So that just says the balloon's within a box of about 70 by 100 miles. And that's uh, different, like I said, than APRS. APRS will give you, you know, pinpoint down to the foot where the balloon is. So, but with Whisper, we can only transmit the call sign, a four character grid square, the transmit power, and the forward error correction. And it's only 50 bits. That's all you can get. 
Um, so on the balloon, we really want to have the altitude also. So we hijacked a power field and we encode the altitude in by changing the power field as the balloon's flying. And then after we receive the whisper transmissions, we can do some post-processing on the ground and pull the altitude of the balloon out of that. And that's when everything's working right. Um, generally people all over the world, you know, they hear whisper, it gets posted up to whispernet.org. And then um, what I'm doing is I'm running a Python script and that reads the whisper net and decodes the altitude out of it. And then it writes it back to aprs.fi, even though it came in on HF. And then all of our users can use it. And I wrote all this out, but it's actually a little clearer to see when we look at it on a graph here, what's going on. So you can see the balloon flying. It's picked up by an HF radio. It gets uploaded onto the internet into a site called whispernet.org. And it's sitting out there in the cloud. And then every 15 minutes or so, my computer runs a um, Python script that goes to whispernet and it pulls the data out and it crunches it and it um, tries to pull the altitude out of it and then it uploads it to aprs.fi. That's where you would see any of your other aprs signals from anyone else. And then any user can go there to aprs.fi and see it. Uh, HabHub, which is the British um, high altitude ballooning or ARHAB or LU7AA, any of these are the, the major people that look at this stuff. Um, LU7AA is uh, AMSEPT, um, South America. Uh, they used to run the Arecibo uh, telescope and stuff. So that's how Whisper and HF is the one comes in. Uh, again, the limitations on this is it's only 50 bits, so there's very little info that gets. But if the balloon's flying over the ocean, we really don't need to know if it's closer than you know 100 miles. As long as it's in that box and it's alive and moving, that's all I really care about. Um, but when it's over cities and stuff, it's nice to get APRS data. APRS data has a lot of bandwidth, so we can get, you know, out, um, lat longitude, altitude, uh, solar panel voltage. We can send out, you know, cute little messages, all that kind of stuff with APRS. Again, though, that's only line of sight. So deciding which transmitter to fly is, you know, has been in the past a question. But there are um, some that do both. So the one I'm flying right now does both, and that should be the best of both worlds. I'm starting to change my mind on this, but right now that gives us flexibility to do both, and the balloon's doing both at once. So the, again, the APRS would go in and be received by your VHF radio and sent straight to APRS.fi, where the HF signal has to come in and it's post-processed and then sent up there. So a Whisper database, for those of you not familiar, you can go and look at Whisper either uh, on a GUI or on the actual database itself. And it's gonna give a timestamp, the call sign of the transmitter, what frequency it's transmitting on, some signal to noise ratio, what the drift is, and that's in Hertz. So the, the drift during a two minute transmission is generally zero to one Hertz for the full two minutes. So these have to, these are really stable transmitters. This is not a, it's, it's quite an interesting thing. And then the power, again, the power is uh, converted over to altitude. And then who received it? And this happens to be one of our local club members, uh, Dan, W60AS, received it. And uh, where he was and how many uh, kilometers or how many miles, you know, what the bearing was to it. So you can see here, there's, you know, 2,500 kilometers, pretty common. This is at 10 milliwatts. So 0 0.01 of a watt being received, you know, 2,500 kilometers away and fully decoded 100% before it gets posted to here. Uh, that in itself always amazes me. And then again, the whisper spots, instead of the raw data, they can be, uh, there's a option on there to map them. And you can see this, this particular balloon was, you know, over Canada and has been picked up down here in LA by Dan, but also in Chicago and up in Alaska all at the same time, all at 10 milliwatts. And then when it gets loaded up to APRS FI, um, you, it'll do tracks for you and you can see where the balloon's been flying, how it went over the ocean. Now you have to kind of interpolate between the nighttime sections here, excuse me, when it didn't report in, 
but uh, for the most part, it, it gives you a fairly decent path of where the balloon's been flying. Um, that all kind of goes out the window when the balloon heads up towards the North Pole. <laughs> I'll talk about that in a second. Um, and then on any of the APRS stuff, just like any other APRS signal, you can click on it and you can pull up different information. So this one here, you can see is flying at 43,000 feet. And there's some information here about the frequency it was on. And you can tell that this was actually uploaded from an HF. So it's post-processed and uh, it was a whisper signal and then pushed up to APRS. So flight 12 in 6 CVO 15, the one that's up now, I mentioned it's 51 days and it's still flying. It's been four and a half circumnavigations. It's flying at 43,000 to 45,000 feet. The whisper signal is reporting the wrong altitude. And that is another mess up on my part. You know, we always upload all the software to these transmitters, you ground test them. And the very last thing you do is you put them out in the sun and you make sure you pick them up on a radio and that everything's working right. And at the last moment before we launched, I had this great idea. I was going to change one of the messages in there. And when I uploaded this, the code back to the tracker, I grabbed the wrong file. And so it's got a bug in it and it's not reporting the right altitude. But every time it gets over uh, APRS uh, station that can receive it on the ground, we get the correct altitude. So uh, just another lesson learned. I, we already knew that lesson. I knew it and I violated my own rules and yeah, it kind of bit me. But as long as the balloon keeps flying, it's all good. Uh, so far we have, uh, this is actually updated. We have uh, about 2,012 spots have been logged. So it's been received on the ground 2,012 times successfully decoded, put on the internet, and uh, I pulled that data down. The furthest spot's about 5,000 miles, and that's a whisper uh, transmission, uh, again, at 10 milliwatts. And then uh, the APRS ones are all been done at half a watt. And so where is it now? Well, last night at about 9 p.m. our time, it was right in the center of Russia. And you can see, if you look over on the left of the screen here, it was going north of the coast of Greenland here. And then we didn't hear from it uh, for a day. And then the, the next day, last night, it showed up here over the center of Russia. Well, the path, uh, the flight path is not this direction. The flight path actually went up here and then back down like this. And even though that's a, nice, a big curved line, believe it or not, that is the straightest path between Greenland and the middle of Russia. If you look on a globe, or if you look on Google Earth, and you tilt it up and you look from the pole, a straight line from here in Greenland to the middle of Russia is actually up right over this island here, and then right down through here and right to here. And you can see the angle it's coming down, kind of curve that out in there. So that is actually the straightest line between those two points. Um, and again, it's because we're used to looking at all our maps in a flat view. And if you look at them actually on a real globe, uh, and it's kind of neat. Uh, this one did go within a couple, maybe with about 100 miles of the North Pole. And uh, how do I know that? Well, we use flight prediction software. So. When the balloon's going split, you want to know where it's going to be tomorrow or if it's going some area that you might not get any transmissions, you uh, can use some uh, tools. NOAA has a great resource for us. They allow anyone to go in and use their supercomputer. And you used to have to register to do it. And it was still no big deal. You just register an account just to make sure you didn't mess around and uh, do it. Now you can actually use it without even registering. So you just Google high split, NOAA high split. And uh, there's a balloon trajectory model there. You put in a bunch of data. And it's all pretty self-explanatory. And then you click on it and you give it some time to process. And it can take 15 to 30 seconds to process. And it'll spit you out a, uh, a trajectory of where NOAA says the balloon's going to be. And if you put in your data really correctly and you've been really detailed about where the balloon was and the times and everything, it does an incredible job of predicting where the balloon's going. Um, it, it's really good. The other thing you can do if you just want a general idea of where it's going and you don't want to do all that hassle, you can just use windy.com and set your flight level for three, 
you know, flight level 300 for 30,000 feet or flight level 450 for 45,000 feet. And you can look at the winds all the way around the entire earth and you can see, oh, my balloon's here. It's, you know, it's over central Russia and the wind is blowing, you know, uh, towards the east. And, you know, you can just get a big picture of where it's going. You can also see storms that are coming up and stuff like that. Uh, but, you know, you got to interpret it in your brain where you think it's going. But it's, it's fun and it's easy and it looks really cool. So here's a, uh, one of the NOAA predictions. And this is a prediction I ran about an hour ago. So the star on the left right here is where it was last night. This is central Russia. And if you're not quite familiar with it, more people are becoming familiar with Russia in the layout and the maps in the last few weeks than they ever have been. Uh, but this is Russia here, right below the Wednesday here. This is Mongolia to kind of set the little sticking up over here is China. So over where the star is, that's where it was last night at 9 p.m. our time. And NOAA predicts tonight, uh, probably around the same time, maybe a little earlier because it's heading east. Uh, we'll have a little sunlight a little earlier. It's a little further south. So any time now, it should show up. And if propagation's good, we got to remember the propagation also comes into effect here. If propagation's good on 20 meters, um, we should be able to pick up that 10 milliwatt signal or someone should pick it up. And uh, we'll start getting some reports from the balloon. So that's what I'm hoping for. It's weird what's going to happen. Noah's predicting it's going to come up here and it's going to go up and curve around through Siberia and looks like either headed back to the North Pole or it's going to do a big loop. So hopefully I'll hear from it tonight, maybe on Thursday, and then we can run some new models and the weather may change you know, over that time. So some of the interesting places this balloon's flown over already. Um, I always find this is one of the most interesting parts of it, is looking at all the geography, because we've had a lot of interesting things. So it's flown over this particular balloon. It's flown over Libya and Egypt, Afghanistan and Turkmenistan. And then it also, on its first lap, it flew over Ukraine and Crimea. And when it was over there, uh, over Crimea, it uh, stopped transmitting in the middle of the day, just suddenly. And kind of thought maybe it had been you know, had some sort of electronic warfare or something happened to it and it got knocked out. Um, what most likely happened is if the balloon is not getting a good GPS lock, it will not transmit. It does not want to transmit bad data and it doesn't want to uh, transmit in areas it's not supposed to. So there was a lot of uh, GPS spoofing going on over there. And uh, they probably, and I'm just kind of interpreting this, it probably had some bad GPS data and decided not to transmit. So that's, that's that area people are becoming more familiar with in the last few weeks. But last year, it flew, um, it flew over Wuhan and Beijing, which are also familiar for people from, you know, the last couple of years with COVID and everything. Uh, it flew directly over the two. You know, it was really interesting and it transmitted. And there was APRS stations picking it up on the ground in both of those cities. And then, of course, it seems this balloon seems to be loving Russia. It keeps flying around and around. Sometimes it leaves Siberia, goes over the North Pole, and comes back down to Russia again. <laughs> and uh, it did a direct overflight of Moscow, and it spent a lot of time flying over Siberia. Also Mongolia, North Korea, and as you saw, Greenland and Iceland. And it's been within about 100 to 200 miles of the North Pole twice so far. So this is really interesting. I've had another balloon fly over uh, Belarus and Chernobyl. We had some interesting things happen there and uh, just the general geography. I've also uh, received some email from people where it's flown over their areas. So kind of cool stuff. So is everyone still with me? You want me to continue on? I'll show you some. Uh... Please do. Yeah, continue. Okay. So that's the, the general about all of the balloons, how they work. That's that. Uh, this next part is just uh, some pictures I'm just going to talk about offhand, and it's from QuartzFest. So uh, those of you who don't know, QuartzFest is a big gathering uh, out in the desert of Arizona. QuartzFest 2022 this year, we had, oh, I think Marty said we had around 700 registered people. So there's probably quite a few more that didn't actually go and register. Um, but we had about 700 there. That everyone's out camping. It's dry camping. There are antennas like you can't believe. Every kind of design and direction and 
wires and cables strung everywhere. And it's spread out over, oh man, about a mile by about two mile area where people are parked. And then there are tens of thousands of other RVs out in the desert during that same few weeks. So during that, they have, during the week at Quartz Fest, they do presentations all week. And that's me up in the front up there at the table. And these are people that have come out and they're listening to the presentations. And of course, I'm talking about Peekable and it's what else, right? Uh, it's also on uh, Amateur TV. So there's an Amateur TV here. It's being broadcast to all the people around, um, not just the hams there, but other people in, out at Quartzsite and out in the desert were picking it up. I actually got email from two different people uh, that had watched the presentation on TV and they weren't quite sure how they were getting it, but they were really interested. They weren't even hams. <laughs> Uh, this was our campsite, the tent that we got set up in here in the background. That's where we assembled our balloons. And what we did is each morning we got up way before the sun came up, um, my buddy Jed and I, and we would build a balloon. We would fill it up. We'd get it all balanced to the right uh, buoyancy. And then right at sunrise, um, we would make an announcement and some people that were really hardy would come out in the cold and uh, they would watch, watch, watch us launch a balloon. And we did this each morning and our crowd grew bigger and bigger and bigger each day. And uh, we put up a whiteboard in front and we started writing down each of our flights and what was going on. It. And this became the central attraction where people congregated day and night around our campsite. And listen, it also had a little display of some of the components and some other information. This is a drone shot of our campsite. So we had our tent back here. This is our balloon assembly tent, uh, our couple trailers. You can see we have masts up. We have long wire, or, uh, we have off-center fed dipoles. We have BHF antennas, we have all kinds of stuff. This is just our campsite. And we camped a little bit away from the other folks. We had some room to launch the balloons. This is inside the tent. This is one of the balloons we, we filled up each day. And you can see it's got a weight on the bottom. And uh, that's how we uh, would measure how much gas we put in. We know what our payload weight was going to be. We would put a heavier weight on the bottom than what our payload weight would be. And we subtract the two and we set that on a scale. And that allows us to set how much gas we put in there. And the amount of gas from just right to way too much is just a teeny little squirt of gas. There's so, it's such a fine line. It's, it's really hard to describe, but uh, it's really tough getting that balance just correct. Here's one of our launches of our early mornings. The camera is sucking in a lot of light, so it doesn't really do it justice. It's just barely getting light here. So it's way early in the morning. And uh, these were two of the cheap Chinese balloons and we have an APRS tracker on it and we just let it, just let it go. This is the group. So we wanted to launch uh, 15 and 15 was gonna use a bigger SBS balloon and we had to have perfect weather to launch that. And we'd had wind the whole week and we were able to launch the, the smaller uh, APRS balloons, uh, but we wanted to launch this bigger balloon with a full 20 meter dipole antenna on it. We needed perfect weather and we hadn't had it. And we'd launched uh, the other balloons on Thursday morning and Thursday, I guess, I don't know, about nine or 10 o'clock in the morning, the wind died down for a short amount of time. So we made an announcement and we rushed in and we started putting another balloon together. And we came out the, we were just starting to get a little bit of a breeze, but we had quite a crowd here. And uh, we uh, went ahead and we launched this balloon. And what happened? Oh no, it froze up again. Okay, bear with me one second. I'm gonna restart it. I'm going to comment, Brian, that uh, I, I saw the launch of N6CVO-15 from one of the seminars. I, I missed the announcement because uh, I was at the seminar and all of a sudden we all looked up and everybody's watching it from, uh, you know, from the uh, seminar area. <laughs> so it was nice to see that one go up. Well, thanks. That's great. Okay. Oh. Okay, so here is all those people gathered outside. My buddy Jed and I were inside this tent putting this together. 
And uh, so there's the transmitter, there's the dipole. I already showed you this picture once, but it'll make a little more, uh, it's a little different scene when it's getting ready to be launched. Um, you can see in the background here, we have the heat sealer on the table. We've got the balloons filled up and balanced. We're now connecting the payload to the balloons and we have some weights hanging on here to keep them from getting away or getting damaged. We took it out. It was really difficult getting it outside because like I said, this is a large balloon. There's almost no gas in it. And it's very, very fragile at this point. And we're trying to deal with this 5,000 inch wire is the dipole. You can see I've, I've spread out the top part of the dipole. The tracker is sitting on the ground over here by the blue spool. And I'm spooling out the other end of the dipole right now to the weight. And once it's all clear, we, uh, we let the balloon up in the air and we start walking with it. And as the balloon goes up, we walk out the line and you carry it. And that's why we gotta have perfect weather. And if you look at that balloon, I'm gonna back up one screen here. There is very little gas in there. So it looks like a big floppy thing, like we haven't uh, you know, filled it up properly. And then as it goes up, it hasn't gone up very far here and you can kind of see that it's already filling out. Just that little bit of altitude, it's filling out. And you can see a little dot down there where the tracker is. And this is our board that became the, the center of attention. Man, there are, I bet there are 5,000 pictures of this board taken. People came by day and night, congregated, stood outside. We had some great talks. Uh, it was incredible. So we talked about you know, each of the launches and what the call signs were and what the, the status was each day. So we had all of these going on here. We had five of them that we launched. So a little bit about the resources that are available if you're interested in this. Um, groups.io, there's a Pico Balloons group and you just go Pico Balloon on there on groups.io. And that's really where most of the folks hang out that uh, you know, have some really skills in this area. Uh, as far as tracking or trackers goes, um, no, excuse me, tracking it goes, you can look on APRSFI. Uh, that's the easiest way to look, um, look up a balloon. Whispernet.org has the, the database and also the GUI for any whisper signals coming in. Um, you can also look on ARHAB, that's Amateur Radio High Altitude Ballooning, uh, or HabHub also. That's the uh, British version of it. And then as far as uh, predicting where it's going to go, NOAA High Split, I said you can just Google that. It's, the URL is really, really long, so it's easiest just to Google NOAA High Split and it spits you right out to where you need to go. That's where you can uh, predict tracking of the balloon. Uh, it's also a tracking site so when bad things happen, like when Fukushima happened, uh, NOAA High Split was used, and that's one of those things, to track where the airborne uh, radiation was going to go. Uh, they also use high split uh, for a lot of volcanic eruptions, things like that. So high split's a cool tool to have for other reasons. And then again, windy.com. Windy.com is just fun to play with. Um, go on there. You can click on the wind area and you can set your uh, altitude that you want to look at the winds. You can look at the winds on the surface all the way up to um, at least 45,000 feet. I don't remember exactly how high it goes. Uh, other resources for actual trackers themselves. The QRP Labs group, um, they, um, they make and they sell a tracker that's uh, pretty good. It's called the Light APRS. There's two different trackers there. Zactech makes a great tracker. It's whisper only, but it actually does uh, uh, multiple uh, frequencies on whisper. So I flew one of those on my other balloon that circumnavigated and was doing 20 meters and 30 meters. And 20 meters and 30 meters at 10 milliwatts into a 20 meter dipole. So those of you guys that know a little bit about antennas, when you put a 30 meter signal into a 20 meter dipole, that's about the worst condition you could get, right? That's about the worst combination. And then only 10 milliwatts. And that 30 meter signal was being picked up really consistently at about 1,000 to 1,200 miles. So lots of places where propagation wasn't good for 20 meters, that signal just got through. So I'm a real fan of that, even though it was going into a 20 meter antenna. And there's some other guys like WB8ELK. He's been doing uh, ballooning of all sorts for um, decades. So there's a lot of good information there. He also builds a, a tracker. 
And there are some other people building trackers now too. Most of them are one-offs and uh, they're all very similar in some aspects. So it's, it's all fun stuff to do. And there's a lot of um, open source stuff out there that other people are making. They're building one-off trackers and then sharing the, the PC buoy layouts and stuff like that. And again, I mentioned balloons. You can get them through Scientific Balloon Solutions, which is SBS or AliExpress, uh, depending on what you want to get. And then there's like everything else in ham radio, there's subgroups in all of these. So there's people that don't really fly these. <laughs> they just want to experiment with the balloons. So they'll buy all these different Chinese balloons and they've come up with these extravagant test rigs to test them out for pressure and seam bursting and all of this. And they use Arduinos and Raspberry Pis and you know all the stuff to analyze it. And they're all into just when it bursts. Of course, there's a huge group that is just programmers and they're writing different code for this stuff. And then all of the people into the microcontrollers and stuff that are hardware guys like me. And, uh, you know, we struggle with the software. So there's lots of different subcultures within this small niche of uh, ham radio in itself. So uh, it's pretty, uh, pretty interesting. And I just want to thank my friend N6JD. He's one that was instrumental in making these flights a success. Um, we have totally different skill sets. And looking at these things from like drastically different angles, uh, we come up with some really good ideas between the two of us. So, so keeping an open mind and having someone that, that looks at this drastically different than you do, um, you know, it helps out. It adds to the value. And then I really want to thank everyone that's been interested in this. That's, that's why we're doing this. It's, it's fun to do, but when you have feedback from people, um, yeah, that's really great. And that's pretty much it for me. I'm going to uh, stop sharing here and I'm, Totally open to questions. Let me get this uh, stop sharing. Okay. Uh, I went on and on and on. Uh, do you have questions? Well, I, I certainly have some questions. In fact, I've been starting off with a list. Uh, you know, you've had, you've shown those those 12 launches and you did five of them at uh, Quartzfest. When are you planning your next launches? Mm, I really don't know. Okay. Um, the, the, Quartz Fest ones of the five were because really with COVID and stuff, we had really slacked off. We hadn't done any launches for quite a while and we were building stuff and it was kind of building up on the desks. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And, and we had launch. So when we went to Quartz Fest, we had this idea that we would launch a couple balloons, but we brought all of our stuff with us and it just got a momentum of its own. Once we, once we launched that first day and people came out and then the, everyone was asking us when we're going to launch the second day, it just grew a life of its own. So we had no plans of launching that many, but we had all the stuff with us. I'm going to apologize because I missed the first two days, both days because I overslept. But uh, I was definitely there for, for three, four, and I saw five launch from, from the, the seminar. I've got a question with respect to balloon color. Is there, is there a reason that you're going with a clear balloon versus a silver balloon or a blue balloon? Is that, is that regarding pressure and heat and solar exposure? You know, it's not my area of expertise, but the way I understand it is the silver ones can actually hold in radiant heat. And there's not much air at these altitudes. So your convection heat, the cooling doesn't work well. And that holds true with the boards too. They can actually overheat even though they're in a minus 10 degree C environment because there's not many air molecules up there. At 42,000 feet, uh, there is 83% of the atmosphere is below you. So that's my understanding of using the foil balloons. The first one we launched was a foil balloon um, and it worked, it worked pretty well, but I know there's folks that have actually instrumented these and that's what they tell me. And do you happen to know what the fastest recorded speed or that your balloons have ever traveled? I have a 300 kilometer an hour speed on one of my balloons. That was over ground. Yes. <laughs> okay. Wow. <That's> so <laughs> that doesn't mean the balloon, the balloon was traveling with the air mass. Right. So the jet stream was moving at that speed. 
And some of the balloons we launched from Quartzsite uh, that week were had really high speeds because the jet stream was tearing down through Arizona and across the southern U.S. at a super high speed. And that's what was putting our balloons out in the North Atlantic such a rapid, you know, the following day. They were going in, in a 24-hour period from Quartzsite, Arizona to the North Atlantic. That's remarkable. I remember on the, the first launch that I saw, which was number three, uh, the balloon started heading due south and there was a, uh, a cloud bank over Yuma and you were commenting that you hope it gets over the cloud bank so that it didn't collect moisture. So, <laughs> And then your low level winds and your high level winds are different. And so when you're getting ready to launch, you need to take that into account. You need to look at what are the what are the ground level winds, what are your medium level winds, and what are the high level winds. And at Yuma, uh, or excuse me, at Quartzsite, almost all the balloons headed south first. And then once they got above, I want to say about 20,000 feet, they just turned due east and went flying across the country. And once they got up in that jet stream. They were amazing to watch. Thank you. Any other questions? I'm sure somebody's got questions. Hey, actually, I had a question really quick. Uh, sorry, it's a little dark here. This is uh, Joe in 6 BFG. Yeah, go ahead, Joe. Yeah, um, so I was wondering with the uh, with the transmitters, um, are you limited to half a watt or is it all dependent on the board? I mean, is it possible to lower the transmission power in order to, I guess, in a sense, save power? Or is it just that's what's uh, recommended in order to uh, reach stations on the ground? Well, it's actually based on that RF module. That's a standard RF module. And I don't remember what the part number is. And um, it does uh, two meter transmissions at either a half a watt or one watt. And it's just the amount of power you have available. And because it's doing a half a watt, but the APRS burst is so short, it's less than one second, your watts consumed is low so you can actually um you know we, the solar panel will charge up the supercapacitors and save all that energy up and then you can send out that short burst at a half a watt or you can even do it at one watt you know and that's and but the reason it's half a watt or one watt is just because that's what that electronic module that's just a standard uh, transmitter module Oh, okay. Gotcha. And then uh, I guess my other question was, um, I guess Patrick kind of already asked um, about any possible future launches. Um, I, I was, I thought it would be pretty cool to watch one of those go off and I'm not going to lie after watching this. I kind of want to make one of my own. So I just didn't know. I just didn't know how well it would turn out. Well, we are reluctant usually to invite a big group of people to launch because what happens is you get launch fever and you feel the pressure <laughs> to actually have to launch, especially if people have driven from all over the place before sunrise and they're out there waiting to launch. And if things aren't quite right, if I mentioned one of my balloons early on that crashed into the ground. Um, that's because we felt the pressure to launch. Uh, so for the most part, we don't really plan and say, hey, we're gonna launch next Sunday, whatever, um, for those reasons. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, uh, uh, if you guys ever do have a future launch planned, I mean, uh, I'll just sit there with a cup of coffee, you know, I mean, uh, <laughs> I'll just, I'll just enjoy a nice morning. So no worries. Okay. Ryan, do, do you, you know, once you have launched a, a future balloon, how do you publicize it so that we know where to look on, on APRSFI? Um, you can go on um, Hab Hub, H-A-B-H-U-B. And the British do a great job of posting all the balloons that are floating. And they just pull that data out and they crunch it and can tell it's a balloon and they post it up there. So if you have a balloon that's active, it almost always shows up there. Okay. So that's the easiest way if you just want to see what's flying right now without knowing what all of the call signs are and everything. They also put up the, the sons, the weather balloons, and they put up the, some other activity up there too. Uh, let's see, there was something else I thought about that I didn't tell you guys. Oh, um, Whisper, you know, again, I, I keep harping on Whisper at 10 milliwatts. Um, it's also picked up by shortwave listeners, not just ham radio operators. 
So they can actually pick it up and decode it because they're not transmitting and post it up on the internet. So occasionally you'll get uh, a spot from someone that doesn't have a uh, ham radio call sign. They'll have a different uh, nomenclature. I'm not sure exactly where that number comes from, but they're short wave listeners. So that's, that's another interesting thing. Well, that's really cool. And then um, back to Joe's question about the power on the, the two meter the APRS side, the whisper side, the 10 milliwatts comes from the fact that that's basically a TTL output, just a, an output from one of the chips, just like your regular signal is going to turn on your LED or something. It's just coming out of there and being pumped into the wire at the right frequency. So there is really, there's no amplifier there at all. Okay. So that, so that's kind of like, um, uh, how people make those, uh, pirate radios with the raspberry Pi and they just hook a wire up to, it. it's just that, that output power that it just naturally has. Uh, you can do that. Most of the raspberry Pis are using the same transmitter model that the APRS ones using though. At least the ones I've seen. Oh, okay. Yeah, you're not going to pick up APRS at 10 milliwatts. That's, that's going to be a, a whisper or uh, maybe you can do a, a CW or QRSS. Any other questions? If not, I've got one final question. One of, one, one of the, uh, the members tonight uh, sent me a, a personal uh, chat message saying, can you have Brian speak about his, his uh, Tesla coils briefly? <laughs> briefly? Yeah, real, real briefly. And <laughs> I, I, it, everybody, if you go to uh, Brian's uh, QRZ page, uh, N6CVO, he's got some wonderful pictures of, of, of Tesla coils that he's built or been, you know, participated in. I'm assuming that you're building these, you know, because you're, you're, yeah. uh, you're a, a machinist, you know, by, by hobby. <laughs> so uh, some of the pictures there, you had a fairly large size Tesla coil uh, shooting, uh, shooting sparks out or, 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 or lightning bolts, uh, you know, 10 feet and more. Yeah. Yeah. We, I was doing a lot uh, at one point um, commercially and we were doing between uh, usually 12 to 16 feet was was where the most were and it was really a commercial theater so um at the time there was a lot of companies that would you know bring their employees in or they'd have these big shareholder meetings and stuff and they were trying to wow everybody and <laughs> we'd come and do to integrate the testicles and part of that along with your theme parks and your museums and stuff so i i was pretty lucky i got to you know travel around the world and do some stuff as a hobby that became a business <laughs> Um, I'm going to assume none, none of your Tesla coils are UL listed. <laughs> so actually, we actually did have to get them fire marshal approved for like uh, the theme parks and stuff. So they do, a, they do a special thing. You have a company comes in, comes in and they, they want to know where all the parts came from. And if all the bits and pieces in there are UL approved, you can. But UL is not a safety organization. UL is a, an insurance company mm -hmm. <laughs> or insurance group. Yeah. That's a whole different ballgame right there. Whole different yeah. discussion. Well, you could you can take a whole bunch of UL listed components and build an electric chair that you'd never get a, an overall safety approval for. So. <laughs> right. Yeah. So just amazing the pictures. Everybody go to, to uh, QRZ and, and uh, check out N6 CVO. So, so if you ever make it to Switzerland, I have some really cool exhibits still running there at the uh, at the Swiss Science Museum. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thank you, Brian, very much. We appreciate you uh, spending an hour, hour and a half of your evening tonight, uh, scheduled five months ago. <laughs> so we, uh, we, we certainly appreciate you uh, visiting us and, and sharing that information. There's also, if you go to uh, YouTube and type in Quartz Fest 2022, there's a, a, actually a video that somebody took of several of the launches. Yeah, there's also drone footage. Um, Gordon West did a, a, a little bit of a talk about what was going on um, with the balloons along with the rest of Quartz Vest. Um, there's quite a, quite a few once you start digging into it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's just, just extra resources for uh, the members to, 
to uh, look up if they're if they're interested. So once again, Brian, thank you very much. We appreciate it. And uh, I was hoping to have a little a few more people here tonight, but uh, it, 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 the appreciation level is still very, very high. Oh, it all works out. It's all good. Okay. So thank you very much. And, and uh, thank what, you. Is there is there a chance that your meeting tomorrow night will extend past seven o'clock or is it is it likely to be only about an hour's worth? Uh, it'll probably be over by seven or seven thirty. OK, because I might still slip by, but I can't be there by six o'clock for your meeting. So yeah. I'll, I'll do my best. All right. Does anybody else have anything that they want to discuss before we close our meeting tonight? Guess not. Well, looking forward to uh, to seeing everybody on our Monday night net. And uh, next month we have a, a presentation about beginning cost contesting. So uh, it should be interesting for those who have uh, aspirations to contest on HF. One more thing, Pat. Yes. I, I just got the recent, I just got the magazine, like literally a few minutes ago, the uh, ARL on the air magazine. Okay. And there's a good article on there on what whisper is. Okay. And so it doesn't talk magazine. about ballooning because as I, as I mentioned, we're, we're hitchhiking on an existing system out there, but it, it does a good article on uh, what it is. Perfect. Thank you. All right. All right. Good night, everyone. I'm going to go and Thank get you. ready for an early morning. I'm still working. I'm not retired like a lot of folks. <laughs> yeah. Well, my best wishes. Congratulations on your, your August uh, you know, retirement coming up. Thank so, you very much. Take care, everybody. And thank you very much. We'll look forward to see you on Monday evening nets. Thank you, Bye, everybody. Good night. All right. Thanks so much. Take care.